great. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session, which is um, R and Python. And we're pleased that it's hosted by uh, Gary Hudson, who is um, Head of Advanced Analytics at uh, NHS Arden and Gem Foundation Trust, and also Andreas Soteriades from um, Nottinghamshire Foundation Trust, and Andreas is a data scientist. So thank you both for um, presenting this uh, for us today. We hope everyone finds it really useful. Um, feel free, um, if you have access to the chat box, then you can post questions there. Um, we also have uh, the option that you can post uh, questions and then we will publish them so everyone can see. Um, we would ask that if possible, um, you keep your mics off at all times. Um, and if you have any issues, just let us know. We hope you enjoy it. Okay, guys, can you see my screen? Okay. Okay, so what I'll be taking you through today is um, Reticulate, so how you can use R and Python together. Um, happy title, happy union, but that's the kind of best title we come up, could, could come up with. So launching straight into it then. So there's a couple of ways that I'm going to take you through around configuring the ideal setup. Um, then how you can pass data through the R environment, how you can then pass it through to a machine learning library um, called Ski Kit Learn, and then how you then um, evaluate and visualize your outputs in, using R and Python. And then Andreas is going to launch into the benefits of using uh, Ski Kit Learn versus the native R packages. So um, in terms of configuring your Python setup then, so the, thing, the first thing you need to do is list all the actual setups that you've got in the environment. So the first kind of step before this would be to install Reticulate. So Reticulate is the interface between R and Python. This allows you then to work directly with Python objects. So when you use the install package as Reticulate, it comes with a mini Conda installation. Once you've completed that process, so once you've gone through the installation process, you can list the number of um, kind of Conda environments that you've got available. So our mini Conda will be default and our reticulate will also be default. Um, and I've created my own environment here, which is my preferred approach for dealing with um, and containerizing um, your Python packages and content. So creating your own Conda environment then. So to create your own environment, it's as simple as passing the new variable name to a variable, so I'm going to call it my environment. I'm going to call it R reticulate and probably something cheesy like Gary environment. You use then the conda create function to create that environment in the mini conda installation. And below the outputs of the markdown document, you can see that that uh, environment's now been created. So now you're kind of ready to start working with R and, uh, uh, and the mini conda installation to start working with R and Python. So the next step, so in Python, you'll want to install some of your native packages. So for Python developers, you'll be aware of some of these libraries. So there's a library called Pandas um, that allows you to work with data frames, similar to our data frames. It's important to note that actually, if you created your own environment, you need to specify the environment name where you want the packages installing to. So Python's data frame library is pandas, NumPy, it's their array library for working with, like say, um, matrix multiplication and linear programming, that kind of thing. So yeah, you need to install NumPy as well, which is normally a default. Seaborn is a matplotlib visualization library. Um, it's kind of built on top of matplotlib um, to allow for some nice visualizations to be built. What Andreas will be talking about shortly will be the Ski Kit Learn library. So essentially that's the machine learning library that's been built uh, in Python for working with uh, machine learning prediction problems. And we're going to specify the environment name again, similar to my environment. And again, all these need to have this environment name variable specified. So the next step is to use the environment that we've created. So you do this by use underscore Conda environment. You'll then pass your environment variable to that and that will then specify the environment to use. And then you can also print out what version of Miniconda you're working with. And then finally, as I did previously, you can do the Conda list. So list the current environments that you've got active. 
So I know that all my packages will be installed into the R Reticulate Gary environment. So now we've installed Reticulate, we've gone through the packages that we need to be built into Reticulate. We're going to now import those packages into our R environment. So in, in Python, for Python developers, it will look slightly different to this. So I'll just switch to R for a second and show you the. This is how you'd import into Python. So import Seaborn as SNS, give it as an alias. And then if you want to import specific things from the pandas library, you use the from pandas import series and data frame functions. So switching back to my um, markdown uh, outputs, you'll see that actually um, what we now do is import it as you probably be used to in R. So NumPy, I'm going to specify the variable name for this one. I'm going to use the import functionality in NumPy. And then that'll import that package um, to that environment. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of a lag on my mouth. I do apologise. And then import things like ski kit learn. So if you've got specific libraries like the ski kit learn linear model, which is the example that we're going to be using shortly, you'd use that functionality. In terms of importing visualization libraries, so I'm going to import SNS, so that's the, the handle for uh, Seaborn. Let me use the, the uh, matplotlib library to import that as well. So it brings all the all the kind of packages that I need to be working within Python to play to work within R. So in just as you program functions in, in R, you can also program functions in Python. So functions in Python, um, you're used to obviously using the function syntax in R. In Python, you start a function with def, so uh, defining the, the function in the Python memory. So to run a function and to work with it in R, you need to use the pi underscore run string function. Pass the whole function parameters in your quotations as a string. Um, and then to access that function, what you'd need to do is use the pi command that's default into reticulate. I've called this function square root and I'm going to pass a value of 10. This then will then run that function that's been created in memory and I'll return the output. Another way of doing that and uh, one that I potentially uh, like least is the pi eval because you have to hard code. You could use a paste function to uh, work with this, but essentially you have to put a string literal in there as opposed to actually accessing it as a kind of uh, list element as you would do in R. So yeah, there are two different approaches to how to work with functions. Again, that's just a side note around how you'd pass functions uh, between R and Python. So on to the main task at hand then. So modeling with uh, Python and R. So we're going to use a very simple uh, linear regression example. So a multiple linear regression. What I'm going to do is bring in, um, so we're going to try and predict the time to be seen based on a few different metrics. So the data setup part, I'm going to use the time to be seen uh, read CSV uh, default that you probably work with uh, before in R. This is going to bring back what columns have been imported, so that's from the read R package. Then I'm going to then just take a sample of that uh, that data frame, so I'm taking a fraction of about 20% of the size just so it's um, easier to work with. So in terms of splitting data, so we're going to create a machine learning um, uh, linear regression model. We're going to separate out the um, the independent variables into X. This is how Python likes to handle them. So we're going to do some list slicing of the time to be seen data frame. We're going to take the first uh, one to three columns, which was uh, age up to assessment to time to first see minutes. And then the, the actual time to be seen is the fourth column in that index. So that then assigns it to the, the Y variable. Oops. Sorry guys, I've, has that been lost? Just let me go to the output. I do apologise for that. I don't know what's happening. Okay, view it in the browser instead. So,
So we're up to this part. Do apologise for that. So splitting the data out. So you've got your X and Y variables. So the thing you're trying to predict, which is time to be seen, and the independent variables. So this is where it becomes important. So learning the difference between casting to and from R and Python objects. So to create the whole data frame as a, a Python object, you need to use the R underscore two underscore pi command. And there's an inverse of that pi to R, which we'll use um, shortly. So that takes the time to be seen data frame. So that's how we traditionally split it in R. Um, and here, what I'm going to do is specify the independent variables. So there'll be the X variables that I'm going to pass into my model. Then again, I'm going to use the R to pi on the X, which has been previously saved into memory under the X variable here. Um, the pi Y, so R to pi for the Y, so the time to be seen. And then I'm going to use a native Python command. So we do it the same way as we do to access elements in R. We use the dollar sign notation. So pi time to be seen, we're going to access the head functionality, and this is a call directly to the Python to give me the head of that data frame, similar to what you do in R in the head functionality. And then I'm going to specify in terms of another Python call, the types of data. So it returns as float 64. So you, that will look slightly different to what you used to see in tibbles and uh, data frames. And again, there's a couple of different methods that we can utilize. The pi describe functionality, that's very similar to if you ever used a summary of a data frame in R. It brings back all your descriptive summary statistics, so counts, means, standard deviation, min, max, and your quartile ranges. And in terms of listing all the Python attributes of that data frame, you can do the pi underscore list underscore attributes, pass in for the time to be seen variable, um, that we've just created, so the R to Pi function, and it will bring back all the Python elements and objects that you can actually work with in that data frame. Quite a long list. You'll see some of those that we've previously used, but these are the summary functions that you can use from uh, pandas like aggregate and stuff like that. Again, it's a massive long list. There's a markdown book to support these outputs, and that's going to be uploaded to the R NHSR community GitHub site. So going further down from there, there are all the elements. There's about 429 different uh, ways that you could work with that data, so transposing, transforming it. If you know Python, that'll be uh, useful. If you don't, then, then not to worry. So then I'm just going to take a length. So what you do in R is do the n row or n col kind of count for this. With pi, it's pi underscore len. Um, to get the uh, length of the data frame and it prints out that we've got 1110 records so now what i'm going to do in r there's something called create data partition out of the carrot package in python there's a actual um, train test split function so what we're going to do is we're going to split the data down so i'm going to have um, from the sl model selection when we're doing the imports, this is what I imported as the model selection part of first uh, ski kit learn. I'm going to import the train test split functionality from the Python library. I'm going to call this a variable as split. And I'm going to pass in so the independent variables, so the things that um, cause, cause the thing to vary um, and the actual predictions of time to be seen. I'm going to specify the test size, so it's going to be 75% in my training sample and um, the other 25 in my testing data set as a traditional simple uh, machine learning split. So now what I'm going to do is use um, set of variables in, in, in R. So pi x train R to pi, so I'm going to pass in the split. And because um, Python's got something called multiple assignment, so when you specify a, a variable, what it will do in Python is it will basically assign uh, a train train X split, a test X split, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to access the relevant ele elements in R, and you do that by uh, accessing the list indexes. So I know that actually the pi X train is in the split two, my pi x test is in the first position. And again, I did this through the process of elimination, looking at the sample sizes. 
The pi y train is in the fourth index and the pi y test is in the third index. Then I'm going to specify the, the head of the x train. Let's have a look at what the data looks like. So now it's in this form. This can then be passed to a scikit-learn object. Oops. So fit and model in scikit-learn then. So what Andreas will uh, delve into uh, in the latter part of the, uh, the talk will be around how we can uh, compare these methodologies and runtime versus R. So the next step is to fit a linear regression model in scikit-learn. Unlike R, um, scikit-learn requires you to instantiate the model, so to create a, an instance of it before we start working with it. So what we're going to do is the um, scikit-learn library. Um, again, this is based on the variable name that you gave it when you were importing the package at the top. Um, and we're going to access the linear regression model. And again, I'm going to call this an R, R native function of SK underscore linear regression underscore model. The model, I'm going to use the SK and regression model, and I'm going to use the fit parameter in Python to fit my pi x train with my pi y train. Um, and again, fit the model, um, Python takes it and input as separate NumPy arrays, as I've, I've said previously. Then to calculate the R squared, so the overall, um, how much the overall independent variables explain the thing that you're trying to predict, uh, we're going to use the model score. So we're going to use the pi x test versus the pi y test. And then the model score will be implemented and saved into the R library as this R squared function. So then that will then go into your R environment. So to access the model results, you'd use the following code. So model intercept, you you'd, um, output the intercept from Python. Model coefficients, you'd output the coefficients um, and then you can print out the model intercept and the coefficients of each of the, the predictor variables. So whatever that relates to in the um, in the data parameters that we put in earlier, it's I think it was age, et cetera, et cetera. So then once that's been passed through in Python, you can see that it looks slightly different than you'd, you, you'd be used to calling it in R. We're going to make some predictions with the model. So to make predictions with the model, um, we can use a testing set that we've created um, using the, the scikit learn train test split function. So here we're going to use uh, the model predicts um, the pi x test. So we're going to predict. So we've held out a sample of our x, uh, a, tr a test set to predict how well it fits. So that's essentially why you, you divide it into a train test split to assess how well it is at uh, predicting the uh, training set before you then put it out into live production. And it, it enables you to evaluate how good the fit of the model is. And then what I'm going to do is save the model results. So here, this is where I use the pi to r syntax. So they're still Python objects. I'm going to use the predicted, um, the predicted time to be seen as a model to predict. Obviously, I've made a typo here. It's not temp, it's uh, time to be seen. Um, I'm going to use the pi to r functionality um, to specify uh, which one of the Python objects I want to then return into that data frame. And then the y test, so the residuals, I'm then going to store in that data frame. So essentially what I've got here is my predictions from my model, the actual actual test set labels, so what the actual values of the time to be seen are, and then the residual from um, the actual labels versus the predictions to give you me that residual. So again, get three columns are predicted, the actual and the residual. And again, it's important that you then recognize which ones are Python objects versus which ones aren't. And in the R environment, in R Studio, you'll get a, um, a sense. Hopefully everyone can see my R Studio screen. There's only a few problems at test. But you can see that um, it's then specified these are part of the module map plot lib libraries. And these belong to um, the Skikit Learn linear model library and the Skikit Learn pipeline and the Skikit Learn model selection. And this all links to the, the variable names that you called it in the import phase when you were doing the imports in the Python library. So let me just go back up to the imports. That's not, that's the installation. So here, sklearn model selection, import sklearn.model selection. So if you were working with um, 
Python. You do from sklearn import model selection, um, which is slightly different to how you do it in R. It's import sklearn dot model selection, not from sklearn import model selection. For those that you know Python, that'll be useful. Otherwise, this is how you do it in uh, R, working with Reticulate. So going back to the markdown uh, document then. So that's how you make them product predictions with that model. So what then I'm going to do is visualize the fit in Python's Seaborn library. So my prediction results are here and I'm going to do again, pass it back because it's now been converted back to an R object. I'm going to pass it back to Python using the R to Py um, reticulate syntax. I'm going to pass in the model results and then I'm going to look at the data types. So you can see that they're all uh, floating point numbers. And this will print out the data types of the Python objects. Um, again, you use the, the dollar sign notation to access the elements in R. So we create a line plot in Seaborn. So I'm going to use the SNS um, dollar sign line plot uh, functionality from Seaborn in Python. I'm going to pass in the data as my um, PI model results, so the model results that were passed through to Ski Kit Learn. They've been then fitted in that machine learning model and passed back through. Uh, and then we're going to specify the X as the actual and the Y as a predictor. So it looks at the actual um, distribution between the uh, actual and predicted values. In terms of um, then saving these figures, I'm going to use the plots um, dollar sign save fig uh, notation. And then that will save a figure into my images um, images subfolder uh, linked to my working directory. To make it work with, obviously, um, our markdown, you need to use Knitter to just include whatever's in this window to get it to work with our markdown. And you can see then that gives me a plot of uh, the predicted versus actuals with a kind of error band here. Going down further. So if it's to create the same plot in R, you just use your what you're probably more used to, your ggplot libraries to do a similar kind of thing. And there is the potential to work with Plotly as well in um, in Python. That's well supported in Python, uh, but I tend to go back to R for that. Again, mixed uses. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to plot a similar kind of bar, but I've got a smooth um, geometrical line. I can use Plotly to then navigate between the actual and predicted values to see what the uh, what the residual error looks like. And again, you could also uh, create a residual plot. So that then, what we've done so far, we've passed data through from R to Python. We've done some summary stats on that data. We've then imported the relevant libraries from Ski Kit Learn and NumPy and uh, Pandas to work with uh, fitting a linear regression model using Ski Kit Learn. We've then visualized that those model outputs using um, um, Seaborn and uh, using Plotly in R. So yeah, that's then how you can then start chaining those processes through. So essentially then once I've got these outputs, um, I could then uh, run, it, run external scripts into Python as well. So you can essentially set a, a chain up between R and Python to, for R to do part of the process. So to output the data, which I'm going to show you in a second. So run an external Python script then. So what I'm going to do is write out the results from the R environment. So I'm going to select everything. I'm just going to get rid of the ED pres presentation within 30 days from the time to be seen data frame. And then I'm going to use the data table functionality just to do a fast write. So write the data out into CSV. So the data is in now in CSV format. So if you look in the data table, you'll see that I've got time to be seen now output there. Going back to that, what I'm then going to do is I'm going to pick up um, this, this file here. So I'll take you through the file in a second in R. I'm going to use the pi underscore run file syntax and I've saved a SNS underscore plot Python file to support this. So you'll see that it's actually in my directory sitting there as a Python file. R Studio now lets you work with Python quite nicely. So what I'm going to do is packages I'm going to import the relevant data frames. Um, again, there's a bit of uh, jiggery pokery in terms of the parameters that I need to make the figure update. Again, I won't go that into that in greater depth if you've never seen Python code before. 
And then what I'm going to do is uh, use the data frame. So I'm going to set the data frame in Python, and I'm going to use, they've got a similar command to read it all, read underscore CSV and pandas. I'm going to use read the data and the time to be seen CSV, which has been outputted as part of the, the R process. I'm going to print that data frame. And then I'm going to create a few functions. So there's an SNS plot in uh, Python, which is native, which essentially gives you uh, density distributions and nice visualizations. There's similar plotting uh, capabilities in R as well, but I just wanted to give you an example of how we could then consume this data from a Python file, create a function, which can then be used to pick that data up um, and set some similar to how you'd work with aesthetics. So if you wanted to group by something and then basically I'm just saying if if there's an issue, just ignore those warnings. So again, like suppressing warnings at all. And essentially what this does is it, all it does is it consumes that data and it makes this descriptive plot of that data using the make underscore SNS plot function that I, uh, I highlighted here. And essentially all that is is the it's an if and else condition. It looks at the SNS pair plot, it takes in the data and it sets the hue value based on the parameters that you pass that function. So it's just essentially a quick wrapper, wrapper function to work with that. And then it will give you some descriptives and some dimensions and data types, which we've we've looked at previously. So going back into that then, so essentially the, the kind of pipeline is R outputs the data. Python then um, picks up the data. So in the next part of the script, it'll output that. It will run that Python file and then it will save it as a figure into Python. And then it includes the graphics back in the pair plot. And as you can see um, on the screen, you get this nice looking, if, if somewhat uh, weird and cluttered density distribution. Obviously, I'm looking at the number of minutes of the, the grouping factor, but you, do, you probably do something a little bit better than that. OK, so that's essentially how you then run an external file with Python. And the next next example that I'm going to utilize is working with a similar function. So if you have worked with something called correlation plot, so core plot, you know, there's a similar functionality in Python called heat maps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a variable in R called core. I'm going to use the pi underscore time to be seen command and do the correlation of that. I'm going to get rid of the previous figure from the, the Python environment using the plot um, clear function. So it clears the figure. And then I'm going to create an SNS heat map. So I'm going to press the results of the correlation between the time to be seen. So the uh, all the variables in there. I'm going to set the annotations equal to true. So it prints out the labels. And the C map is the actual uh, color palette that you want to use, similar to palettes in R as well. Um, and I'm going to plot and I'm going to save that figure into my images and the correlation plot. And again, you need to use Knitter to include those graphics. And it gives you very much a similar correlation plot that you, you used to see in an R. In terms of the images that are outputted from this, you can see that actually it's outputted my correlation results into that. So navigating back. You can do a little bit more. So essentially with the method that I've outlined here, it gives you full integration of R and Python into your scripts. If you worked with it in Markdown, you'd essentially have to run these as separate chunks and it wouldn't work in terms of integrating these commands together. So this is the best approach from all the research that I've done. OK, in terms of that, that kind of concludes the reticulate part of the, uh, the presentation. I'm now going to switch over to Andreas, who will talk to you about the benefits of using um, Ski Kit Learn. Thanks, Gary. Gary. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, can you hear me to begin with? Yeah, OK, thanks. So uh, I'll share my screen with you. Uh, as Gary said, I will be talking about uh, Scikit Learn today. I tend to pronounce it Scikit Learn. Uh, Gary calls it, uh, pronounces it Scikit Learn or Ski Kit Learn. Uh, to be honest, I don't know if there's two ways to pronounce this. If there aren't, probably Gary wins. But anyway, I, I pronounce it Psychic Learn, so that's how I'm going to be referring to uh, for today's presentation. Just saying this so that you don't, uh, you, for, uh, so that you can conf get confused. Um, so, to, I would like to make a brief introduction about uh, how I've been working as a data scientist 
so far. I've been a data scientist for a few years now, and I've, uh, I've done a lot of quantitative stuff in academia as well. And my number one language, my number one choice has always been R. So uh, I, I never really needed to use Python. I could do everything I wanted to do in R. So uh, the, you know, there was no need to, to switch to another language. But then I started uh, my, my current post, which involves language, uh, natural language processing and the text mining, text classification, uh, sentiment analysis, and all this uh, stuff uh, related to text. So then uh, I realized that there was a need for me to uh, move into something uh, more advanced than the packages available in R for, for text uh, classification and, and, and mining. Uh, so it was, um, in a way, it was natural for me to, to switch to Python, uh, but I also wanted to, to be able to have the Python and R to communicate because there is a lot of visualizations that I do in R with Chinese and Golem. So I wanted to find a way to uh, integrate the two so that to do all the, the more sophisticated text classification stuff in uh, in Python, but then to easily bring all this stuff uh, into R and continue with the development of my dashboards and visualizations. Um, so he, there is a piece of code here which I'm not going to run. It's just uh, it just uh, so that you see how simple things are can be done with with Articulate. So w what I've done here, this is a uh, um, this is a Python process, the pi underscore uh, run file and pi underscore run underscore string uh, functions are uh, functions that are calling Python scripts. So everything has to do with the machine learning pipeline that prepares uh, the data set uh, and the pipeline and uh, builds the pipeline and produces the results happens in Python in the background. And then we can bring everything that Python has produced by using pi and the dollar sign and do visualizations or manipulation in R with uh, ggplot and, and the tidyverse. Uh, so it, 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 the first time I ran this, I couldn't I couldn't believe my eyes to be honest because I, I didn't I hadn't realized that it was actually that easy to build something in Python that you can then call in R and uh, do whatever else you want to do in R. So uh, here, those scripts, well, there is a lot in the back, involved in the background. These scripts are big, but at least I could keep them independent, build, structure my pipeline exactly how I wanted it, uh, Python style and scikit-learn style, and then be able to, to pull everything I wanted from there directly into R using uh, pi dollar, uh, the pi dollar command. Uh, now, uh, because Gary has talked quite, it, it, in, uh, in quite a lot of depth today about uh, how to use R and Reticulate to produce stuff. I, I wanted to focus more on a, on a more high level presentation of scikit-learn and to compare it with popular machine learning languages in R so that um, you can make your own choice. You can, know, you can know the pros and cons of using one or the other and make your own choice depending on, on the needs of your project. So I have prepared a little presentation uh, about that. Let's uh, begin. So uh, scikit-learn is probably the most popular machine learning library in Python. It's a whole, uh, it's a massive project. Uh, there is an awful lot in there uh, in terms of machine learning, uh, data preparation, pipeline preparation, tuning, and, um, uh, and uh, model building. It's, uh, I, I would say that it's uh, quite comprehensive, anything that the machine learning engineer needs to know or to have, the whole toolkit is there. Anything that isn't there, such as more advanced deep learning models, can be easily integrated with uh, with wrappers. So uh, you have a very nice interface, uh, which is quite advanced and uh, fast and efficient, as I will be talking about later, uh, that offers you an awful lot of choices for building machine learning models from scratch. Um, so I would say that if if you're not familiar with Python, but you would like to do machine learning with Python, definitely start with, with scikit-learn. Uh, it also has quite a lot of advantages uh, relative to, to key machine learning packages in R, like tidy models and MLR3. So um, I would like to make a comparison between the three so that you have a few uh, pointers where to start from. Uh, right. 
so here is a, a table comparing some of the key characteristics that I thought that were, well, some characteristics that I thought were important to, to discuss. So you don't necessarily need to go through the text. I'm going to, to talk about the stuff that is, uh, that is presented in here. Uh, but I thought it, it'd be nice to have this table for your, uh, so you can uh, refer back to it on your own time. Um, to begin with, in terms of uh, machine learning models, uh, all three libraries, they have a quite, uh, well, they have, they have a nice interface where you can bring my different machine learning models uh, and use them in, in a similar way. And by a similar way, I mean that uh, a you don't need to really uh, uh, have to bother about the nitty gritty about how, what the data uh, data um, requirements for each package for each uh, model are the the data structure you know this kind of things the the interface take will take the data will pre prepare them in the way format them in the way that the the models each of the models require and they will pass them into the pipeline and uh, do the predictions. However, there is a, I think, a quite strong disadvantage with R, uh, which is that it borrows models from different packages. So, on the one hand, it's great that there are interfaces like tidy models and MLR3 where you can actually bring all those models together and uh, make comparisons uh, and build pipelines without really having to use different commands and different data formats for each model. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the fact that there are different packages uh, written by different authors is also a disadvantage because uh, some authors may not have the uh, time or the skills to, I don't know, make models faster or add some uh, key features that may be missing, actively maintain the package, um, have uh, better, more efficient defaults for uh, for the hyperparameters of, of the models and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, in scikit-learn, the, model, the models in it are, are, be, are built for it. So the idea was to build, to, to make an integrated interface, let's say, of, of models that are built for this specific purpose. Scikit-learn, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't really borrow. It, uh, it doesn't borrow models. The, border, the models are built from scratch for scikit-learn. So this is a great advantage. Uh, on the other, let, now let's talk about speed. Um, I don't have a benchmarking exercise here to show you what the differences are, but I can tell you from uh, own experience that uh, that uh, scikit-learn uh, is is way faster than than uh, than the R packages, um, especially in the field of text classification where I'm working now. The the difference is mind blowing. I mean, we're talking about. Uh, a few minutes versus a few hours. So we, we would be doing something in scikit-learn in, in a few minutes that would require a few hours to do to do in R. So there is a massive difference in speed. Now comparing tidy models and MLR3, I think MLR3 could probably be faster and more efficient because it uses some packages uh, that uh, are advantageous in terms of speed. First of all, it uses R6 objects, which are, which is a more up-to-date um, type of, of class used in R that uh, offers some efficiency gains. But uh, equally importantly, and perhaps more importantly, it also uses uh, the package data table. Data table is a more efficient and faster, more efficient version of, of R's uh, native data frame. And it was built for, uh, for fast uh, computation times. So when you have really massive data sets uh, that R cannot handle uh, with the data frame function or that even tidyverse, dplyr and, and, and the like cannot, uh, cannot handle, a uh, data table normally, normally can. So uh, the MLR3 guys, what they did is that they said, OK, well, we want to focus on two things in terms of uh, controlling things in the background. We have R6 and data table and everything that enters our package will have to be um, based on these two. And if the data the data set is in a different format, it will have to be converted to data table because any uh, manipulations that, that the models may be doing later on uh, should be fast and efficient. So whatever goes in is handled with data table 
and uh, and that's how the package works. So this is a great advantage. I mean, I think this is one of the this is probably the number one reason that I, I like MLR three so much. It's that they are very focused on what they want to do when they don't uh, try to make the whole thing too big and out of control. Um, which reminds me that uh, a few years ago, Caret used to be the number one package uh, for machine learning in R. It was another quite successful interface, which was an extremely uh, diverse. There were a lot of models and a lot of options for different things like class balancing and other things that you one would like to do with machine learning. But I think in the end it became so big that uh, it ended up being bug infested and, and, and quite inefficient. The MLR3 guys, they say uh, we have a, a package called MLR3, which borrows from a package called MLR3 learners, where we have three or five or six, I don't remember, but very few learners that will be using our data table format and also utilizing R6 classes and that's where we're going to focus on. So they're trying to keep things under control to avoid inefficiencies and bugs and whatever else. Uh, what are the, any other problems that would have occurred otherwise? Um, so for example, there is a there is one random forest package that uh, that uh, MLR3 um, uses and it's the package ranger. If you want to use the package random forest, uh, you can implement it yourself and deposit it in, a, in another uh, package called MLR3 extra learners and then you're expected to maintain it yourself and fix, fix issues yourself. So they're quite focused. MLR3 learners, a few basic learners and that's it. Um, now in terms of user, user friendliness, I would say that uh, the tidyverse between MLR3 and, and, uh, and tidy models, I would say that the, the tidyverse has a strong advantage because it makes things for users very familiar, especially when you're, I mean, when you're learning R, when, when you, you, if you're an R user, you would almost certainly, probably certainly, you would be using the tidyverse with all the, you know, with this function, this funny function, uh, percentage sign greater than percentage sign where you're piping everything all together you, you have you write you write your functions line by line uh, a very nice way of, of styling your code of, of being very clear what you're doing step by step and so on and so forth uh, so it, uh, tidy models uses the same style so if you're familiar with it it's very easy to catch up it's really i mean it's pretty straightforward and they've also the the, the tidyverse guys have done a lot of effort have put a lot of effort into creating loads of resources there are online videos there are um, uh, blogs there are books there is a lot of stuff there so if you need help you you can uh, always uh, if you're stuck you can always um, do a, a, an internet search and you will find plenty of of of, uh, of resources so so i think it's also more appropriate for newbies because number one it will be very easy to find support online and number two uh, because of the tidyverse style um, uh, that uh, that the that tidy models um, uh, work with uh, now MLR3, the resources, I would say, well, I spent quite a lot of time reading the resources, so in the end I got one way around it. I mean, I, I could use the package, but some of them are outdated, so they've changed things in the packages, but the resources that they have available online uh, use early, earlier functions and earlier commands that don't exist anymore, so this can be quite frustrating when you're trying to learn the package, and the resources are a little are a little scattered. So there is a book which is uh, actively uh, updated and uh, they they do a lot of effort, they put a lot of effort into actively updating it as, as often as possible. There is There are more, um, uh, more chapters, more in-depth analysis of how the package works and what stuff you could do, but still I don't think, I think it lacks this um, solid well organized and consistent structure uh, that the user guy of uh, scikit-learn has. Just to give you an example how the, the, um, the scikit-learn uh, user guide looks, you have a very nice user guide here with everything that um, 
that you will you would like to know in uh, in chapters. There is a search engine. Uh, there are APIs. There are examples. Uh, everything is in here. There is theory. There are references. So you can even learn theory. Maybe you want to learn about support vector vector machines, for example. There will be a little bit of theory, not too much, but there will be theory. Actually, more than enough for you to be able to understand how they work. So it's uh, I definitely advantageous in this sense. Psychic learning is de de definitely advantageous in this sense. And now, uh, in terms of text classification, which is, uh, as I said before, is my focus, uh, and I think it's quite important to to mention some, to make a little bit of a, a review about the uh, review the package three packages in terms of this, because nat natural language processing is becoming quite popular in in very diverse fields. And I would say that. Um, if you're a R user, an R user and you, you're not interested in the reticulate package, you wouldn't like to do anything with scikit-learn and just, you know, then you would like to choose between tidy models and MLA3, I would say definitely go for, for tidy models because I know it is possible because there is an online um, a video, a demonstration of how to do it and it, it seems to be working pretty well. It's, uh, it, they have all the, the functions that are necessary for a, uh, for building a pipeline, a pipeline that's tailored to text classification tasks. Um, I don't know how fast their models are, but uh, I know that it is possible. I know that they have a nice organized inter interface where you can do that. On the other hand, MLR3 is at the very early stages in, text of, in terms of text classification and can be really slow. If there is a, an issue with uh, the way that the, the data sets are handled and prepared before uh, being passed into the models and this slows things down dramatically. Actually, ironically, I, I said before that the, the package uses MLR3 in order to, uh, sorry, it uses data table in order to make data manipulations faster. In this case, ironically, it's because, it, because the, the data set is converted into a data table format that uh, that uh, slows things down. Uh, if you would like to take a look at the at the issue, I mean, there is a. I, I, you see here that there is a link uh, in, in the word "slow." There is a hyperlink, so just uh, take it. Will take you to the uh, to the GitHub um, issues page, and you can read uh, a little more about it. So, but I would say that at this moment, it's not very well developed. And then, last but not least, scikit learn. It's incredible what the, the the collection of of uh, mind blowing, blowingly fast models for for text classification is is massive. Uh, I, it was for me it was like heaven. I was exploring text classification for the first time in my life, and I had an awful lot of models from from different uh, built on the very different logic. Like for example, support vector machines. Um, uh, linear models and uh, perceptor perceptron and all sorts of different models where you you can uh, experiment with and they they are all they are all pretty fast i mean you, you won't believe how fast they are you, you just need to try it and you'll see what i'm talking about um now what's going on it's not changing sorry just a moment just to change slide okay so the verdict so I, I think that's a personal opinion, right? I mean, it, other people may have a different opinion, but I think that tidy models, it's actually better for practicing on smaller tasks, especially when you're new to uh, machine learning and you need to, to get acquainted with all these different uh, processes and jargon, pre-processing, -pre tuning, benchmarking, uh, evaluating the models, uh, finding the appropriate parameters, doing, I don't know, uh, data feature, feature engineering, feature selection, all this stuff. So I think if you are at, at, at a level where you, you kind of know your way around, but you're not really a specialist in machine learning and you would like to, to become a more, uh, a, a more of an expert in this field, start, start with tidy models, start smaller, and uh, and you'll get there. Uh, on the other hand, MLR3 it's a little more advanced because it uses those R6 classes, as I said before, uh, and which resemble a little bit the way that that classes work in in 
in Python, I'm not, I'm not a very, I cannot explain you very well what these classes are. It's not, I, I know more how to use them than what they are and how they work. But I would say there is the, it's this specific structure, let's say, in 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 the language that uh, that offers advantages uh, over um, other languages. Uh, MLR3 uses this structure classes. So if you know if you know your way around or at least get used to how classes look and how they work, then it's easy for you to also use a scikit-learn because it's a similar structure. And also the way that pipelines are built in MLR3 also resembles quite a lot uh, how they are built in scikit-learn. So when I, uh, having worked with MLR3 in the past, when I switched to scikit-learn it was uh, in Python, it was uh, pretty easy for me to understand what was going on and how to, to build things uh, just because they, they look so similar. And I think also MLR3 is, um, is probably better for running bigger and more complicated tasks where you have a um, uh, different data sets, different algorithms, pre-processing uh, processes, uh, data pre-processing processes and uh, uh, data uh, hyperparameter tuning, um, model evaluation, all these things that I also mentioned before. I think in general it's uh, it's probably better, MLR is probably better in this, in those more real life um, machine learning tasks uh, that can be quite, uh, quite complex. But, but as I said before, uh, not with text classification. If you have numerical variables, then I'd say yes, go for it. If you have, if you want to do text classification, then probably go for scikit-learn. So scikit-learn will help you delve deeper into the world of machine learning. Uh, just by referring to the user guide, you're already going to learn so much. Uh, it's, it's just unbelievable. Everything is in there. Uh, and it will also help you to enter the world of Python. Machine learning is huge in Python. Uh, though people who do machine learning will know that. Uh, R is still, uh, I think it's still years behind in terms of, of this. Uh, so if you want to do serious machine learning, just uh, just go for, for Psyche to learn. And then of course you can uh, take it further, learn uh, deep, deep learning models, Keras, TensorFlow, do other sorts of text, um, uh, text analysis with Space Evader and so on and so forth. But my point is, it, it, it's all there. It's all there and it's very well developed. So I, I, I think that uh, that would be my, my, my preference if you ask me. And the uh, Scikit-Learn has helped me um, build models that I, I, I didn't think I would be able to, to build with that, to be honest. So uh, I think that in terms of machine learning, Python wins. But if you if you are a hundred percent R user, like I was until I started this job, well, I would say well, <laughs> that's what Reticulate is for. You will still have to learn Python at least not not Python as a language, but how to use different elements of it. Uh, I learn how to use Scikit-Learn for that reason. I I I can't say that I'm a an expert or an experienced Python user, but I can use scikit-learn uh, uh, very easily. Um, I could say that I'm experienced with scikit-learn. You don't have to know everything in Python to be able to use scikit-learn. So you can build everything in scikit-learn, call your scripts in R uh, with Articulate, make the two languages talk, and everything else you may want to do, visualizations, dashboards, whatever that is, well, you can do it in R. And that's me. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Andres. Uh, we do have a few questions. I could see Tom is answering them as we go. Uh, uh -huh. But would you like to just repeat them uh, in case Gary or Andres have anything to add? Yeah, sure. Thank you for that. Um, great talk. So um, I'll just go from the beginning of the questions. Um, we had some. Oh, Gary, yeah, I see Gary has, has replied to them. So did, was there anything further to add, Anastasia, do you think? Or... 
Uh, no, I mean, I hope everyone can see uh, Q&A as well. Uh, so a uh, question was about uh, what the quote Gary showed to the start was done in Python or R. And uh, as Tom said, uh, first bits was yeah. done so, in R. Uh, and then, yeah, Gary, do you want to carry on? So in terms of the integration into, so there's a question from I know about integrating into code chunks in Markdown. Um, he wants to know the disadvantage of that. I said basically if you're developing an R end Python kind of pipeline, it needs to be done in the fashion that we just outlined in this talk. Um, doing it in R Markdown, it does benefit from sessions like this, whereby you're tutorialing uh, R and Python code and running it in the same environment. But if you want to actually use R objects, then work with Python objects and pass back to R, then pass back to Python, you need to use the, the actual uh, approach that we showed in the session. In terms of, um, um, is it all done in, in R? Yes, it is all done in R, but what you have to get familiar with is the reticulate type uh, syntax. So you'd need to know, like I've said in the Markdown tutorial, the packages that you want to import from Python. I'll give examples in the GitHub repository that will be um, shared after this uh, session. But yeah, then you need to know how to call those packages. But essentially then all you need to get then get to grips with is the R to Pi and Pi to R syntax for passing objects in between. And if you want to create Python functions that will reside in your R environment, then there's that Pi underscore run string command that uh, Andreas and I have both actually detailed in our presentations. There's one for you, Andreas, around, um, and I start to answer this, yeah. around tidy text. So is tidy text good for topic modeling? Um, sorry. I've used tidy text before um, in that for NLP tasks and I like it a lot. I used it and if yes, how does it compare with NLP tools in Python? What's your view? And I said, I've kind of responded on the back of that, but I'm interested in your feedback. I said tidy text is good for topic modeling and sentiment analysis, um, but Python is probably better for the more deep learning type NLP tasks. So you can create things like uh, transforms and convolutional or neural nets, but I'm sure you're probably aware of other packages. Can you just give us a Bit of feedback there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I want to say that first of all, I agree. I agree with you, Gary, that it's uh, uh, good for topic modeling and sentiment analysis, among others. Uh, it, it's not tidy text. It's not for text classification, right? But but it's very useful for sentiment analysis, topic modeling, for TFIDFs, which is uh, a, a way to to measure the uh, word frequencies in, in a text. Some some words that are more important may be more frequent, or some others that are too frequent are actually words that tell us nothing, like I don't know, it or the or a. So tidy text is very good with this kind of stuff, and I'm actually using it now. Uh, part of uh, my text classification is done in Python. My uh, general text analysis. Uh, with sentiments and everything else that I just mentioned is done with tiny text, so I really like it. So I would say uh, yes, definitely, definitely use it. It's really good. Um, and I would like to add to Gary's answer about Python that. Uh, well, there are uh, broadly there are two types of models uh, for text classification. One is the neural networks, deep learning and everything that Gary has mentioned, but then you, you also have the so-called bag of words models, which are very simple models. The, the logic is very simple. You just uh, convert uh, words to frequencies, let's say, uh, and each word becomes a feature, a predictor of your model. So it's a very, very simple logic, uh, but they can often be as good or even better as as a, um, a deep learning models. I, I don't think there is a, you can say deep learning models are better than bug of words models or the other way around. It really depends. I mean, you run your models, you tune them and you see uh, which model performs better, right? Uh, so I would say Python is also better for deep learning, as Gary said, but also for bug of words models. They are mind blowingly fast. There is a massive collection of such models. The user guide is very good, so definitely go for it if you're uh, if you're doing text classification. Go just for Python. Come, yeah. Sorry, Andreas, just come yeah. in there as well. I've also in the comments attached the link to the Julia Silgier, yeah. David Robinson ebook in case you are interested in doing that more. 
I say it's more descriptive analytical uh, techniques that you use. So it's good at creating visualizations and like you say, and doing those um, term, term frequency transformations. Yeah. But there's also the the actual, the, resi the, the first package was the TM package. So it also explore that as well. It's, no, it's yeah. more old school base R, but it actually has got some good functionality in there that I don't think has been brought through in the tidy, tidy way of uh, working. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's that as well, just to add. Okay, that's, I think that's the end of the questions. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, thank you both very much for um, hosting the session today. I'm sure it's been really useful to everyone. Um, and thanks everyone for attending. And I hope everyone gained something from it. And we have some more events coming up, so just keep in touch with the NHSR community. Um, and um, as uh, Tom mentioned at the start of the session, um, please do join um, the Slack page because um, people are very active on there. Okay, thanks.